a lot of fans have been requesting Eastern philosophy, which admittedly I have not studied. But today we are talking about Schopenhauer's aesthetics, that's Schopenhauer's idea of what art is and what it does and what it's for, which does have some Buddhist influences. But in order to understand Schopenhauer, we first need to look at Kant, who provided a lot of old Schopi's starting material. If you've been a philosopher fan for a long time, you'll remember this very old episode with poor audio quality, in which we discussed Kant's famous distinction between the phenomenal world and the noumenal world. What Kant called the phenomenal world is the world as we see it, the world of experience. The noumenal world is the world as it is in itself, independent of any experience of it. We don't know what that's like, and we could never know what it is like, because by definition, it is beyond our experience. The noumenal world might be exactly like the phenomenal world, but we cannot know that, because as soon as you experience something, it is part of the phenomenal world. Schopenhauer looked at that famous distinction and pretty much just thought, yep, and he took it and he ran with it, with one modification. Schopenhauer thought that there is one aspect of the noumenal world we can experience. Schopenhauer thought there was such a thing as the will, with a capital W, which he defines, but kind of loosely. He thought the will was some kind of all-pervading spirit or principle or energy which embodies itself, makes itself physical in the form of all physical things, including us. You might think this is a flippant comparison, but I actually find this analogy very helpful. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. The will embodies itself in us, but imperfectly, and our lives are slavery to the will and its continued desire to keep embodying itself. Schopenhauer thought that human life was the will struggling to make itself real, and it failing to do so was the source of all suffering. And here's where the Buddhist influences come in. You can see how Schopenhauer's idea of suffering caused by slavery to the will is similar to the Buddhist idea of dukkha, or slavery caused by desire, craving, or tanha. I am probably mispronouncing those egregiously or getting them horrendously wrong, so I apologize for that. The will is perfectly embodied in what Schopenhauer called the ideas, with a capital I, which are a little bit like Plato's forms, if you ever come across those. The ideas are supposed to be non-individual, pure essences of things, so all cats have a link to the idea of cat, which is what makes them cats, and all chairs partake in the idea of chair, and all humans partake in the idea of human, which is maybe some kind of abstract object distinct from any individual instantiation of it. By the way, if this all seems crazy or weird or nonsense, then don't worry, we are coming to that. The job of art, Schopenhauer thought, is to express the ideas, to express these perfect embodiments of the will, and when we view art that manages to do this, we have some kind of transcendent experience and are temporarily freed from slavery to the will. Schopenhauer thought that in viewing art that truly expresses the ideas, you cease to be an individual. You merge with the expressed idea in a state beyond time, space, and rational concepts. You are freed from slavery to the will, and you experience, nay, you are the noumenal world. So that's what Schopenhauer thought aesthetic experience was all about. And note that it also includes a way of judging how good a work of art is by how well it embodies the ideas. And now some criticisms of the view. To start off with, just assume that everything in that account is true, for now. So when people look at art they have some kind of transcendent experience during which they cease to be individuals, but how come they ever come back from that then? How come people don't just stand in front of paintings forever? Like And Schopenhauer says that viewing art is good because it frees us from slavery to the will. But if I, as an individual, actually cease to exist when experiencing the ideas, then how is that good for me? Nothing can be good for me if I do not exist. In fact, it would seem to be bad for me because I am destroyed. Temporarily. And this is where the big criticism comes in, which you've probably already arrived at yourself. What the heck is this guy talking about? Schopenhauer says that there's this thing, the will, and there's these things, the ideas, but what are they? Where do they come from? What are they made of? How does he know about them? How are we supposed to get to know about them if they're beyond space, time, and rational concepts? Why is the will imperfectly embodied in us? What is the will? Why, if it's perfectly embodied in the ideas, does it feel the need to continue imperfectly embodying itself in everything else? Can he provide evidence for any of this. If your reaction to Schopenhauer was this, what? 
What are you talking about? Then you are not alone. That is a legit criticism. He's got this very impressive sounding ontology, but you have got to back that ass up. But what do you guys think? What do you make of Schopenhauer's aesthetics? Can we even get a handle on what this guy is claiming here? Next time we could either do some pretty easy stuff with what is fate, or we could do what I think is probably the hardest script I've ever written. It's one of the most famous issues in ethics, the Frege Geech problem. For more philosophical videos every Friday, please subscribe. Last time we were talking about who owns natural resources, and it turns out that 101 Koba owns the entire Earth and therefore all the resources in it, so that answers that question. That's all the time we've got this week, thank you very much for watching, and I'm, <laughs> I'm only joking with you. Hi Cheney said that natural resources belong to whoever can exert the most compelling political case for their ownership. Depending on what you mean by compelling, that might not actually solve the problem, because then you'd have to go on to say what counts as a good political case for owning natural resources, which is exactly the problem we were discussing. Peter Retep pushed the idea of nobody owning natural resources and acknowledged that that means that nobody could sell them. Well, unfortunately, we really need natural resources. We can't really get around having to use them. So if nobody owns them or could sell them, you could go and take whatever natural resources you needed without paying for them, which might be great, but you would also have no justification for stopping anyone from coming in and taking yours. Andrew Friend said that natural resources should be distributed evenly across the entire world's population. Well, some people have less need of certain types of natural resource than others, so some kind of system whereby people can choose which natural resources they want to use based on their need would seem to be more practical. In addition, you'd also have the problem of if you had some natural resources and everyone is entitled to a fair share, then anyone could come in and take some of the resources that you were using and you would have no justification for stopping them. There'd also be some practical issues of how do you measure the world's population? It's always increasing. Do we distribute it evenly across everyone who is is born now, or across everyone who has ever been born, or across everyone who will be born, so yeah, practical issues abound there. Booth that John pointed out that democracy isn't an all or nothing deal, a country can be more or less democratic, it's a matter of degree, so we would need to decide when a country is democratic enough for us to be able to fairly buy the natural resources it was selling. They also pointed out that my country, the UK, is not entirely democratic, because we have a royal head of state who does have certain powers and privileges and abilities, and also, probably more importantly, one of the two houses that makes up our government is completely unelected. Those are some very good points, uh, I have some thoughts and I have some feelings about them, I think you're probably pretty much on the money, they're quite pertinent points, but this is not a place to get into an argument about what we should do with the Queen. Uh, I know she's a big fan of the show, she watches it all the time and I really don't want to upset her. Sir2090 asked, what about natural resources that aren't even on the Earth? Who owns those? Well, pfft, hey, good question. I don't know whether 101 Koba just owns Earth or whether he owns the entire universe, so presumably we'd have to ask him. Yampio Plasmatico said that we put the money from the tariff in the bank and it's gone! Uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably quite a good point. I think Professor Waynar published this paper just at the start of the financial crisis, so nowadays we might be a little bit more cautious about giving that money to a bank, especially when people of another nation had a moral claim on it. Deep Ashtray said that supporting a dictator for access to the natural resources they are selling is colonialism by proxy. Whoa, that's a pretty big deal. I, I mean, the former inhabitants of my country pretty much wrote the book on colonialism, <laughs> and then invaded everybody and demanded that they read that book, but uh, yeah, that that comment is deep. Ashtray. <laughs> That's all the time we've got this week, thank you very much for watching, and I shall see you in the next episode. Bye! Some fans have been requesting Eastern philosophy, which admittedly I have not studied, but in this episode we are talking about sh** and sh**ing. Hell, how That's my microphone. My microphone just fell off the... Well, it just fell out of the cravat that I used to keep it tied to the thing. It's a very high-tech operation we're running here, as you can tell.